uh, you have these compressions going on because the outflows are not outflows are not a uniform velocity, and uh, these make these uh, pileup regions that are cusp-like in shape generally. what you're looking at. Thank you. That sounds better. Uh, now, the sector structure of the interplanetary magnetic field is interesting. We heard that, it, we heard why it was a Parker spiral shape. And uh, there's been enough spacecraft out in the interplanetary medium. This is uh, Helios again, which went into the orbit of Mercury and out. It didn't go in a spiral pattern. This is just the frame in which they plotted it. Uh, it orbited between Mercury's uh, orbit and uh, the Earth's orbit. So we, uh, we do have a, a, no a good knowledge of what the interplanetary field is in that region. And you can, uh, in fact, uh, take solar rotation length swaths of magnetic field data and you can color code it by whether it's outward or inward directed and stack it up, uh, and the red and the blue is outward and inward, radially, for the radial component. Uh, stack it up by Carrington rotation, and you see these patterns of red and blue. So what, what you're observing, and you'll see it in the Omni data, and we saw it in the Omni data before when we were looking at a plot of polarity, which is basically the sign of the R, um, is that there's a flipping of this Parker spiral field in the ecliptic plane, um, and at 1AU in particular here, uh, that you can see that's very clear, and pretty, you know, pretty well-defined reversals uh, from one polarity to the other. Now these, uh, you can see the co-rotating patterns kind of evolving. Uh, here's a, a bunch of red that lasted a number of Carrington rotations, um, a bunch of blue that lasted a number of Carrington rotations in this spot. These are co-rotating patterns that come and go as the source structure of the solar wind is changing. Now the boundary between the positive and negative sectors of Parker spiral field uh, defines the heliospheric current sheet. And uh, this is uh, putting the picture together here. Uh, we, we saw that uh, the corona made made it into the interplanetary medium in the form of an outflow called the solar wind, which moves up to uh, hundreds of kilometers per second, typically, uh, that the sun rotates. And so the magnetic field is being carried outward with the solar wind. By the way, in the corona, we're in a magnetic field-dominated region. In the solar wind, we're in a fluid flow-dominated region. Uh, so that is why near the corona, the field looks like a perfect dipole because everything is co-rotating and stiff. It's a skeleton for the coronal plasma. But as soon as we get out beyond about a few tens of solar radii, the fluid takes over and controls what's going on and carries the magnetic field with it to make the Parker spiral. And uh, because we're going uh, in and out of domains where the solar wind is carrying outward field from the sun, uh, and domains that where it's carrying it, field that's inward to the sun. Uh, we have a heliospheric current sheet that, when you consider the, the rotation, will wrap around like a, I think of this as a rotor in your uh, washing machine, your laundry facilities. But it's often called a ballerina skirt model of the heliospheric current sheet. And they even have a bashful ballerina, which means you don't always have a heliosphere current sheet that's symmetric around the ecliptic plane. It can be uh, cone-like downward or upward. So you can have a bias in your average interplanetary field uh, that persists sometimes, depending on what the sun's pattern of polarity 
looks like in the open field regions. They're producing the solar wind, which we'll see, see, see soon. Uh, you might not want to get into the kinetic details of the solar wind in your career. It's a whole other uh, bailiwick, but you have to bear in mind that this is plasma physics. Uh, the solar wind is a plasma, and people study the velocity distributions, three-dimensional velocity distributions of ions and electrons, uh, how they're controlled by the magnetic field, um, also uh, their velocity distribution. Here is a, a proton velocity distribution in the solar winds showing the main Maxwellian of the cold solar wind, and then there's, there are super thermal particles of various origins, uh, which we'll mention a little later. Uh, here's that electron distribution that I was telling you about. Going back again, uh, this is the solar wind bulk speed here right at the peak. You can see the spread of the, uh, the ion speeds around the bulk speed, and it's very narrow. So for the particular temperature, the ions are cold uh, relative to the bulk speed. But here's the d equivalent distribution for the electrons. Uh, this is zero. Uh, and finding the shift uh, by the bulk speed in the electrons is, is hard. It's a challenge. That's why people usually use the ions when they make a measurement to get the bulk speed. Uh, getting it from the electrons is possible and done, but usually you can trust the ions more because of the narrowness of the uh, distribution in relation to the bulk speed. Now the electrons have an interesting feature called uh, the strahl, which is a hot beam of superthermal electrons that sticks out in some of the velocity distributions of the electrons, and it seems to always be coming out of the sun. So some people think that this is, uh, this is real coronal electrons that are zipping out very fast and not being scattered along the way and tracing the topology of the interplanetary field. They move along the interplanetary field uh, in such a way that they're considered tracers. So uh, just bear in mind that the electrons are quite a different beast kinetically than the ions if you're working in that area on those details. Solar wind helium has its own story. Uh, it too has a Maxwellian uh, distribution in velocity that is centered on the bulk speed of the solar wind. Sometimes there's a slight difference in the bulk speed you get from the helium, the alphas, alpha particles, than what you get from the um, protons. And there's a whole literature about that, the reason for that difference. Uh, but they're roughly, for working purposes, the same. Uh, and we'll talk about this other underlying distribution of superthermal and subthermal ions later on. Uh, the uh, helium, the alpha to proton ratio is of interest because it varies with the solar cycle. And people think it might tell you something about the heating of the solar wind and how it changes with the solar cycle and the origins of the solar wind. And the, helium, the alphas also carry, even though they're a small fraction of the solar wind, they carry a, a decent fraction of the momentum, which some people don't like to ignore when they're calculating dynamic pressures, for example. Now, there's lots of details you can go into with a solar wind. And uh, you know, catching up to speed is very important. If you're going to make progress, you want to at least take a, as much a scan of literature and review papers and websites as you can to, to get up to where people are in their overall understanding. And attending things like a solar wind conference, for example, is very valuable because it's focused. And there are groups that are just talking about kinetics. There are groups just talking about structure. Uh, there's a lot of details of uh, variations, uh, including waves and turbulence, that now occupy a lot of people. They, uh, there's different arguments about why they're important, why turbulence is important in the solar wind, and uh, a lot of strong opinions in that regard. But there's many reasons for uh, a lot of fluctuations to be present, both kinetic and fluid, and by origin. Alphane waves, for example. Um, these things we saw earlier when we looked at this uh, zoom-in version of the vector magnetic field components in the solar wind here, uh, all this fine, rapid fluctuation structure, if you 
I did a power spectral analysis. Uh, you would get a spectrum of, of waves that people think, whether, whether you want to call this a wave or a fluctuation is sometimes a matter of opinion. Uh, when you have uh, a lot of fluctuations present, some of them look sinusoidal, some don't. What's turbulence? What's a fluctuation? What's a current sheet? It's all, mess, all mixed together here. So um, it's a very messy area to work on, put it that way. Uh, there are some cleaner uh, signatures that one can identify. Uh, for example, once in a while you'll do an, a spectral analysis of a time series of magnetic field and you get a nice peak. And the peak might be around the ion cyclotron frequency. You'll say, aha, I've got ion cyclotron waves. And that's probably a, a good interpretation. And if you look at the uh, ion distribution function, you might see an anisotropy in it that might be driving the generation of a wave at that frequency. Uh, mirror mode waves are another one in compression zones in particular, where the magnetic field gets squeezed in places. Uh, the plasma, by diamagnet diamagnetic effects, gets eliminated. Uh, the pressure balance, there's a pressure balance that occurs. So you're increasing the magnetic pressure in the area and you're reducing the uh, plasma pressure. And that, um, these mirror mode waves are seen in places like co-rotating interaction regions where there's compression and in the you know, magneto sheaths of planets where there's compression. So people study those for, as a career, a uh, large part of their uh, research. Uh, so let's talk about solar wind structure and variability because it's really tied in an important way to a lot of what I've seen in the poster session and in what people are doing with understanding the, the connection between what's at 1AU and what is at the sun. We had this old picture of the, you know, the first development of ideas of, uh, we had dipolar coronas, uh, Parker spirals, uh, very smooth outflowing solar winds uh, with different two polarities coming out of the two poles of the sun and open field lines and very nice uh, rotor shaped uh, heliosphere current sheets. So things were relatively simple. And of course, the, these early pictures, uh, when people began to take images of the sun in x-rays and in EUV fluxes and saw these dark spots at the poles uh, that suggested evacuation of material, uh, that, and also in the, some eclipse pictures, which showed two nice uh, streamer belts jived with the dipole picture. Uh, and that was the way people like to think. But now thing, things began to get more complicated. Uh, it was appreciated that uh, the solar wind that was coming out of the low latitude regions uh, was beginning to look a little different from what was coming out of the high latitude regions. Uh, and it got even worse when we had uh, missions like SOHO. We would begin to see in the detailed high time resolution coronal images blobs and globs that were coming out of the streamer uh, belt. And, um, and these could be tracked and seen to accelerate uh, to maybe speeds that were slightly lower than the fastest solar wind speed. Uh, and these were interpreted as being signatures of transient processes, like reconnection at the cusp of the streamer belt. And um, this is still, of course, uh, a hypothesis. And I noticed there was a poster about a model that's attempting to look at the generation of blobs and globs from a helmet streamer. So very active area of research is understanding uh, these small scale transients from the streamers and how much they contribute to the solar wind that we're seeing at Earth. So when we see something at Earth, we, we think of these smooth laminar flows, but we might be submerged in a sea of blobs and globs very often. So the modern view is not the old view of a dipolar corona, nor is it a view of a, a corona that um, tilts with the solar cycle. Instead, it's a view of a solar uh, source region that's much more complicated. Uh, we now appreciate that we have many uh, magnetic field structures that are not of dipolar nature. 
that there are pseudo streamers which are isolated from the main uh, dipole like streamer belt, many of them in this cycle, and that there are coronal holes, open field regions that are distributed around the sun depending on what uh, the distribution of, of all those other features is. So you can appreciate that when you look at some of these uh, coronal images and you see the dark region here and here, certainly not a polar feature. And in fact, sometimes it's very hard to see polar features and it's not just because they're tilted away from you or toward, you know, but it's because they're not there. So we now, I think, can appreciate with all the images we've seen that that early picture is much too simple. And it has an evolution with the solar cycle, of course, uh, you saw this earlier in con connection with the discussion of the irradiance variation, uh, but it also involves the coronal hole structure. If you look at the dark regions, which are the coronal holes in the X-ray pictures in the EUV as a function of solar cycle, compared to the magnetic features on the sun, uh, you will see that the distribution is very much dependent on uh, the busyness of the magnetic field uh, and the strength of the magnetic field on the sun. And only perhaps during the solar minimum period do you have a polar coronal hole picture that's sometimes very clean. If you learn nothing else in your career about the corona uh, and you're working in solar physics, learn to use or and or frequently consult potential field source surface model. It is an incredibly valuable cognitive learning tool for visualizing what, happen, what is happening in the corona uh, at any one time based on what's happening in the magnetic field. And you can even do little games with it, like make your own map with your own features and say what it's, you know, you can look at the sun, you can look at a magnetogram, um, and you can say, where are the coronal holes? You don't know. You can't, can't tell, unless you have an EUV picture and you're measuring them, but look at the magnetic field. You can't tell what the coronal holes look like by just looking at that magnetic field. But the potential field source surface model can give you a very good approximation most of the time. Of course, it depends on your magnetic map and the accuracy of your magnetic map, which we'll get to. Basics is um, it's a potential model. There's no currents, no plasmas. It's just a magnetic field model. Uh, it makes assumptions, though, that are depending on the assumption of a solar wind, like assumption of radial field lines on a certain spherical surface on the outside, and a magnetic map as a boundary condition on the inside. So, um, so those are the basics. It's just a solution for a magnetic field that matches the magnetic field on, that you impose on the inside and assumes things are radial on the outside. Uh, synoptic map construction is an art form. And so if you, if you go online and you find a synoptic map, bear in mind that that's not necessarily a true snapshot of the solar magnetic field. It's uh, something that's constructed from a 27-day record of sometimes daily images. Sometimes they're a little more frequent. And they kind of merge them together in fancy ways. And they don't even see these high latitude fields uh, very well, so they make corrections. Or fields on the limb, on the edges of the sun. So they're treated in a certain way. Now you can just take one of these maps and you see the magnetic field pattern of black and white, and that doesn't look very dipolar. If it were a dipole, you'd see a white strip across the top and a black strip across the bottom. And that's not the way they ever look. Sometimes you can see a hazy white and a hazy black. But most of the field is in this smaller scale structure, uh, which decays away with, comes and goes with time as active regions emerge. A uh, potential field source surface model is basically the solution of Laplace's equation in this space between the magnetic map and the few solar radii sphere, where it's assumed that things go radial. The, the field goes radial. And uh, it's, it's to be viewed as a magnetic skeleton approximation uh, to what's going on in the corona. Here's for the record uh, just a set of equations that describe the spherical harmonic solution 
of the Laplace equation in that volume. Um, you can go through it if you like. It's a fairly straightforward mathematical exercise. <laughs> Bear in mind, if you, if you do do this, though, um, there are spherical harmonic coefficients online that are calculated by other organizations uh, for people to use to reconstruct coronal field maps. Um, but there are normalizations that are different from solution to solution. So you just have to be very careful. And there's a good document that was written up by uh, Sun at the Wilcox Solar Observatory that you can consult if you want to read about uh, the normalization issue. Uh, but, um, but spherical harmonics are nice. You can kind of understand what's going on in the solution. You can solve them the, the equations numerically, too, which some people do. Uh, but in many cases, spherical harmonics are what's used. Uh, recall that the synoptic maps, this is just a selection of them, are very sensitive to time in the solar cycle. There are times that there might be, here you can almost see the black strip across the bottom and the white across the top and one decayed active region. Uh, here, all hell breaks loose during solar max and um, the solution is going to really be uh, jerked around a lot by what is going on in the active regions. The models tie the coronal structure observed in the EUV and X-rays to solar wind sources to these open field regions of coronal holes, and they do a pretty good job generally, um, provided you have a sun that isn't changing its magnetic field on you in important ways on the invisible surface. So uh, you can uh, go into the Gong website, uh, which is a wonderful place to go. I have it on another slide. Um, and you can see the latest uh, potential field sources surface model reconstruction uh, for a particular Gong map. Uh, Gong is the Global Oscillation Network Group uh, system of ground-based magnetographs that are strung around the world so that they can keep updating depending on, so it's daytime everywhere for Gong, and they can keep updating magnetographs and making the best synoptic maps. Um, the closest thing to a constant observation if you don't have a spacecraft um, that you can use. But HMI at Stanford and there are other sources of synoptic maps you can find. You can look at the, the coronal holes which are color coded by outward or inward open field regions here that are coming with this uh, solution and the helmet streamer belt. But the uh, coronal holes, you can see there's two red guys down here and here they are in the EUV model. Uh, the green guys are not so clearly visible, but they're, they're there. Uh, the, here in this lower plot, we have another pattern for another synoptic map saying that the coronal hole is in this location and at the southern pole, and there's one there, and there's one at the southern pole. So you can, I advise, if you're gonna believe your PFSS model and use it to interpret something to check an EUV picture and see how well it's doing with coronal holes. Uh, cautionary note about EUV pictures is that sometimes you have a very dark filament channel feature that looks in the EUV like a coronal hole and it's not. Uh, so the, the, there's gotchas everywhere. Um, and of course the potential field model because of map issues and all is not going to exactly reproduce the geometry of a true coronal hole either. Uh, what I'm, I'm always happy when the, there's a general location and size and uh, feature resemblance. Uh, you can also look at uh, the streamers in a chronograph image and you can see if the helmet streamer that you get from the potential field model is matching what the chronograph image is showing. Here we have a, a warp in the main helmet streamer that uh, broadens this out. And you can see that these two features are probably the, uh, the ends of this warp rather than two separate uh, the helmet fe features. So you have to appreciate the three-dimensional nature of the structure that you're seeing in uh, coronagraph picture as well. Uh, so anyway, I, I truly encourage you to use the Gong website to uh, get an appreciation for what's available there and how, how you might use it in your research of understanding solar wind sources and the coronal structure.
and they have all kinds of products. There's a, you know, flat maps of the helmet streamer belt and the color-coded holes. There's a movie maker. There's 3D uh, renderings. Uh, Features-wise, uh, you remember that the uh, boundary of this, this cusp region of the helmet streamer is where the heliospheric current sheet is starting. And you can see how warped it is at each time that you're looking at. Sometimes you'll get a multiple current sheet these days. And people are beginning to believe that they're really there. It used to be the wisdom there was only one heliospheric current sheet ever. And you could never have more than one. But now people are appreciating that there probably is more than one. Um, and right now is a good time to find them. Uh, OK, solar wind mapping, which is where, uh, where we started. Uh, source mapping, uh, we can see now that here's a case where we have polar coronal holes, but we also have low latitude coronal holes, um, color coded by polarity uh, for a couple of Carrington rotations. Uh, by the way, Carrington rotations are something that is specific to solar physics, and uh, they're kind of fun because I looked, I think it's 1853 was Carrington rotation one, and they've been counted every 27 days since, <laughs> roughly, uh, up to now. You know, we're in the 2100s, I think. Um, so, uh, you know, you can count your life in Carrington rotations, for example. Uh, the, um, in solar cycles, uh, hopefully. Uh, the uh, mapping of open field to the ecliptic plane is very telling, and those are available on the Gong website too. Uh, what, what you do is you uh, put a circle around the source surface, basically, in the ecliptic plane uh, location, and you ask, what open field lines are coming to me in that plane, and where do they go back to you on the sun? And so these plots of uh, red and blue field mapping back to uh, red and blue features laid against this magnetogram here, you can get them with or without the magnetogram, uh, are telling you basically where, uh, you, where the model tells you you are mapping back to at a specific time in the ecliptic plane. So you can see that uh, you're getting structure here uh, outward and inward field, but it's not mapping back to the polar coronal holes. It's all mapping back to low latitude field, open field regions. And it turns out that this is remarkably common, that even when polar coronal holes are present, much of the time you're not going to map back directly to the poles. You're going to be mapping back to low latitude features. Uh, polar, polar field extensions sometimes, like this one, um, but still low latitude sources. And this is just a three dimensional view of some of those mapped field lines, those open field lines going to the uh, ecliptic plane. And as I said, there's movies, and you can see how this changes with solar cycle. Here's a time when we started out mapping to the poles, and you'll see that it evolves to where we're never mapping to the poles as the active regions emerge. So it's a very educational uh, website to play with. And interplanetary magnetic field uh, timing and sector boundary crossings can be inferred from this site. Now, going a step further with the model, uh, people have desired for a long time to be able to make better predictions of what kind of solar wind we're going to have. And speed is an important parameter in forecasting geomagnetic activity, for example. Uh, so uh, some experimental mapping that was done with the potential field source surface model uh, quite a few years ago, uh, trying to infer where the solar wind came from and what speed it was locally, gave rise to a model of uh, how you go from uh, location within a coronal hole to a speed. And what that study seemed to suggest was that uh, that the highest speed, which is the red uh, solar winds, were coming from the middles of the largest open field structures. And the slowest speed, slower speeds were coming from the boundaries of the open field structures. And uh, sometimes you had a feature that was so small that you only got slow speeds from it. So uh, this 
This model, which was originally called the Wang and Shealy model for the developers, initial developers, based on in situ spacecraft measurements of velocity and the mapping back technique, uh, has since been expanded um, by Nick Archie at AFRL. And, um, and so there's a nice recipe for going uh, from uh, where you are in the coronal hole and what the field geometry is there uh, into a velocity that's coming out of it. So not only if you're mapping, making mappings, not only do you have now the potential for the potential for mapping uh, the field polarity, but you have the potential for mapping the velocity that's coming to you. Okay, and this has been applied in the tool that you will use in your lesson uh, called the uh, Enlil model, uh, WSA Enlil it is, uh, because it really uses this, um, this kind of mapping to another model, interboundary. Uh, Enlil is a solar wind domain model. It starts at about 20 solar radii. So the potential field only goes to a few solar radii. Uh, and then they use a fancy scheme to get from the two solar radii to 20 solar radii. And they use uh, that mapping to paint, paint the better part of the 20 RS sphere with velocity, as well as polarity of the magnetic field. And then they assume that things are coming out radially from there at their respective speeds, shown by the color code on this inner sphere and carrying their respective magnetic polarities. And then they solve a magnetohydrodynamic set of equations of outflow, of radial outflow, and they introduce a rotation. And what they can do is get a model, which shown by the black line, uh, can lay right on top of velocity data from 1AU pretty well sometimes. But don't expect it to always be good, okay? Uh, I think people blindly like want to believe that Enlil will always agree with data, but um, it tends to agree with it in a simple situation, a situation where you have a high-speed stream that dominates your scene, but, um, but smaller structures, finer structures, details are, are often not capturable. But it, it really is a first good attempt to do space, heliospheric space weather uh, based on magnetograms. So think about it. The whole modeling all the way out to 1AU is based on magnetograms. And so we need magnetograms. And it would be really nice to have far side magnetograms so that we could really have a full synoptic map all the way around and get the, back, the far side fields properly described because they will affect what's happening on the front. So that is for your generation to accomplish, I hope. Uh, and here again is a, just an, another example of the model. Uh, this was a period when it did really pretty well. There was a lot of co-rotating structure here. And the, uh, you'll, you can see an overlay of model velocity on measured velocity is very good. And the comparison of the modeled um, magnetic field polarity is very good. The magnetic field magnitude tends not to be so good. Uh, there are issues with it. And so mostly you can rely on it for velocity and polarity. And this model uh, gives us insight as to why Ulysses got this result. Uh, in this case, in its early, early round about of the sun, uh, you've seen this plot before, so I don't have to describe it to you. Uh, it was a very dipolar kind of configuration for that particular period. And so uh, the polar holes fill the upper portion of the heliosphere and the bo bottom portion pretty well and uh, cleanly separated hemispheres. This was almost an ideal dipolar case that they captured. Uh, then uh, the solar maximum was around the next time and uh, messed up things big time. And uh, there were all these streamers in all positions and sources and things were coming and going very rapidly and so you have something that isn't quite so well organized. Uh, then we came back to the new solar minimum. Now the new solar minimum is interesting because the sun's field got very weak and active regions got very weak 
and uh, the solar polar fields got very weak. And so we were kind of in between stages of dipolarism and non-dipolarism uh, in the last minimum. And so it was not quite as nice and pretty and ideal as the first Ulysses Pass. So bear in mind that um, this state of almost perfection, dipolar perfection is rare, is probably rare. Um, at least it's rare, it's gonna be rare in the next couple of solar cycles, I believe. One thing to appreciate also as a result of all these mappings and everything that we understand is that we, were, we are rarely in these, this is Ulysses uh, velocity record um, as it went around the sun. And we are rarely in this high speed polar hole outflow. Uh, greater portion of the time we're in the messy part. Uh, so uh, just bear in mind that um, that the messy part of the solar when the complicated part is the norm. Uh, there are cadres of people studying the difference between high and low speed solar wind. Uh, the wind that comes from the boundaries of coronal holes that is the low speed as well as this transient blobby wind uh, are both there, uh, everyone pretty much believes. But what are the relative contributions? Uh, the low speed wind is something we also experience uh, quite normally. And uh, we're, so we're always skirting the boundaries of, of coronal hole sources. We're always, in, the heliospheric current sheet is present at a boundary. Um, so um, the properties of that low speed wind and the high speed wind are different in ionization states and composition. And that tells us something about those sources too that we're still trying to figure out in the field. Uh, so I just, you've seen these movies of the solar magnetic field constantly evolving. That's just to remind you that uh, this is giving us a challenge that we have a constantly evolving solar wind. What we lack is a time dependent model of the solar wind and corona. Uh, people are, have been working at it uh, it's, it's not an easy thing to do. This was an early uh, cartoon experiment that was done where uh, a colleague, John Linker, uh, had an MHD model for the corona and he just took a bunch of Carrington rotation maps and he put them, you know, concatenated them in time and he used them as boundary conditions and drove a time dependent MHD model to see what would happen. And so, you know, the time dependent corona is time dependent all the time. Uh, you see those synoptic maps evolving, active regions decaying constantly by differential rotation, by emergence of new regions. These are always generating transient adjustments of the corona, transient adjustments of coronal holes, transient adjustments of boundaries and sources. And we can't model that. All those models, the Enlil, et cetera, are steady state models. Uh, Enlil does try to update. It's a synoptic map. But a true time dependent model with a time dependent corona has not been accomplished. So that's another thing for you to finally get over uh, the, the hurdle. And uh, the heliospheric current sheets that go with these, by the way, are really fascinating structures. Online, you can find examples of um, heliosphere current sheets for any Carrington rotation and see how, how complex they can become. So space weather um, is, is what we've seen here, uh, heliospheric space weather. It's uh, sometimes associated with technological stuff, but it's really physics. It's really uh, science uh, as well. And we shouldn't forget that. And we should also remember that it affects other, all the other domains of heliophysics, the magnetospheric physics, the upper atmosphere physics, in many ways. Okay, now I have to get through my next lecture in 15 minutes. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna take this one out. And I was told my other one is here. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I see it's down on the corner. Mm -hmm.
Lényeg. I think it might be here open. Can we do that? Okay, thank you. Okay. Hello. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we went here from the time-dependent corona. Now, coronal transients have a spectrum of sizes and speeds, uh, as many of you are aware. What I call the high end of the transient spectrum are these coronal mass ejections. And uh, people envision these as the sun undergoing sudden and drastic changes in um, its boundary conditions and the resulting coronal uh, outflows and adjustments and ejecta that result from that. And there's a lot of uh, different geometries of magnetic fields that are envisioned. There's, uh, you know, loops that open up from being closed. There's disconnections. There's things that are much more complicated combinations of thing of disconnections and opening loops and uh, just expanding loops. So uh, there's many ways to envision what you're seeing in a coronal mass ejection picture. The basics, to me, though, are it's a mechanism for coronal field structure changes. It's the way the sun, um, the sun's chain changes of coronal structure um, are able to adjust by relieving stress, by relieving, by moving open flux from one place to another, closed flux from one place to another. So I think of it as part of the evolutionary process in response to what's going on in the solar, at the solar surface. Now, uh, these coronal mass ejections, the magnetic field in them, um, people have envisioned takes many forms. Uh, sometimes people have, like Nancy Cricker, have envisioned them as being um, a streamer that all of a sudden goes out in the form of, disconnects in some central area and goes out in the form of a flux rope that splits the heliospheric current sheet, literally, uh, and rides within the heliospheric current sheet as part of it. Um, others see it as a localized um, active region phenomenon of a highly twisted structure that expands uh, outward because of the magnetic pressure and tension that exists within that highly twisted structure that may have emerged from beneath the sun or may have been generated in place by photospheric motions in part. Um, and then there's the long filament channel eruptions where there's maybe shearing by differential rotation of an active region might even energize it by uh, introducing magnetic stress along an arcade that's um, bridging a long filament uh, channel. So there are many ways of imagining uh, the origins of these eruptions. And they are modified by what's around them. Uh, the surrounding corona plays a role in what actually happens to them. This is obviously running into something. Uh, this one has twisted for some reason as it's going out, it's a filament material probably. This one underwent a very rapid expansion close to the sun. Um, and then there's loops in all positions with respect to streamers that are seen, even though they seem to originate in closed field regions. Now the halo events are of particular interest for the rest of heliophysics because uh, they're interpreted as being um, coronal mass ejections that are heading right toward the observer. And so, um, so here's a, a really nice one. It fully circles the sun. Uh, and in the, um, uh, depending on which image you're looking at, uh, expands in a way that you can kind of get an idea of what direction it's going in and how it's going to impact you straight on or at an angle. Uh, they also allow the, the modeling of uh, CMEs as, a, as what's called a cone model, uh, where a cone-shaped structure uh, can be fit to the different uh, CMEs to give a first approximation to maybe the way it's expanding in space, first approximation expanding radially, and how big it is, and how wide it is, and um, how fast it's going within the, cent you know, the central 
part of the comb. Now the 1AU consequences are of course very important here. On stereo we had imagers that went from the very small EUV pictures on the inside all the way out to 1AU. Um, these were fantastic images uh, and we could see disturbances propagating and distorting and they provide a basis for model comparisons that we still haven't fully exploited yet. Um, but um, we don't regularly have this uh, potential uh, because stereo just keeps going and um, we don't have a fixed system uh, that can always watch what's heading toward the earth and getting a read on an exact impact time based on a, a heliospheric image. But it's a nice thing to have when you're thinking about I believe this is a, I believe this is a linear scale. So uh, let's look at the 1AU uh, consequences in terms of what's measured in situ, and this is this is really what gives you what's. Uh, This is what gives you an idea of how it's going to affect your, the Earth, the radiation belts, the upper atmosphere, um, the ground currents, and uh, other things. Uh, so um, a simple picture of what a coronal mass ejection generates is often used a, a flux rope picture for reasons we'll see in a minute. Um, and that expands outward and is like a snow plow to the ambient solar wind. So the ambient solar wind piles up. And if it's moving fast enough relative to the ambient medium so that it's super magnetosonic, you know, we're really into a regime of not using sound speed. We're into a magnetized plasma. So we really have to use the magnetosonic velocity, which is a combination of the alphane speed which is magnetic field dependent and the sound speed. Um, when it becomes super magnetosonic uh, relative to the ambient medium flowing, you know, the ambient medium is flowing at a pretty good speed of hundreds of kilometers per second, but this is flowing even faster in some cases uh, and plows through and compresses it and makes a piled up magnetosheath like region uh, around the flux rope. So we call this the ejecta. And I call this the, uh, the sheath and the whole thing and the shock, uh, interplanetary coronal mass ejection. ICME distinguishes it from the CME, which you see in the coronagraph image. So there's confusion of the use of terms in the literature, but um, many people these days like to think of the CME as being what's seen at the sun and the ICME as being what's measured in situ out in the heliosphere. And um, when you look at the uh, sample of data, which is much better than the sample you got in your storm study, uh, for example, uh, you can see uh, there's an ion temperature and a, a density and a velocity and a dynamic pressure and magnetic field components and a total field. And this is the DST index, which measures the uh, magnetospheric reaction to this event arriving. And what you can see is that uh, you see the piled up, the initial shock uh, where everything jumps essentially. The field jumps, the velocity jumps, density jumps, um, temperature jumps, ion temperature jumps. The boundary of the two. Um, very often you can use the density. Uh, the density inside the ejecta is typically back to normal. So you see inside the ejecta portion, you see the big magnetic field and the high velocity, but the density is back to normal. It's magnetic field dominated inside the ejecta. Okay? So the big density pulse is mainly piled up solar wind. The high dynamic pressure phase of a ICME is the piled up solar wind phase and the shock sheath phase. 
So you can see that goes away here, and the velocity is still high, and the magnetic field is still high. And then you have this uh, magnetic dominated ejecta phase, which is sometimes called the cloud, sometimes called the ejecta, sometimes called the driver. Uh, sometimes people call that the ICME rather than the whole thing. So just be aware that there is some haziness in the nomenclature. But, but, but remember that you have phases. You have, sometimes you don't have a shock. But you, for fast ones, big ones, you have a shock. You have, usually have piled up solar wind. Uh, and you, if you're in the line of fire, you see the ejecta. If you're in the flanks, you may only see part of some of this. You may only see a shock go by in a sheath and miss the ejecta or have unrecognizable ejecta. So bear in mind that how this thing goes past you and where you're sampling it will determine how nice this looks. This is a very central head-on impact. Now, if you have the halo CME, your chances of getting this nice full picture are good. And that is where your magnetic storm driving will, will come. So it's interesting to look at the propagation effects and how CME, the CMEs are related to the ICMEs speed-wise. Um, fast events tend to be the, have the most impact. Uh, they cause the greatest pileup of the ambient solar wind. Uh, they arrive here fastest without warning. They cause the biggest effects because they carry a lot of energy uh, as, as well as mass. And so um, if you analyze the statistics of speeds of CMEs at the sun and you compare it with the statistics of speeds of ICMEs, what you find is that they don't agree. And um, what happens is that at the sun, there's a lot of, uh, of quite low speed CMEs. Uh, many that you know are in the zero to 100 kilometer per second range, or a few hundred kilometer per second range, slower than the ambient solar wind. Um, the ICMEs, on the other hand, tend to peak at solar wind ambient solar wind speed. So what's going on here? Uh, there are quad, what are called quadrature experiments, where on a few rare occasions we had the ability to. Um, look at the images of CMEs heading toward a place uh, where we had an in situ measurement by another spacecraft. And so you could get, really get the speed of the real CME without a projection effect. It's hard to get a speed of a halo because it's coming straight at you. And all you see is the expansion. Unraveling expansion from bulk speed is hard. Um, but what we find is that the slow speed uh, CMEs at the sun, by the time they get to the Earth as ICMEs, have sped up to about solar wind speed. So the slow ones kind of get convected along and sped up to solar wind speed. Uh, on the other hand, the fast ones tend to feel a drag force of, their, of some kind, the physical nature of which is still being argued, uh, and slow down. So uh, just because you see um, a very fast CMEs at the sun doesn't mean it's going to reach its destination with that same speed. It will likely slow down. So just bear in mind that there is that, that difference, that propagation uh, changes the speed of the, uh, of the item. Uh, now, the rate of CMEs uh, here is uh, sunspot number and statistics of the rate of CMEs in a study. Uh, as you might expect, the more active the sun is, the more magnetic field structure you have, and evolution of that magnetic field, the more rapid, the more numerous are your CMEs. Uh, speed distribution of CMEs, as I said, many are um, ICMEs, are typical solar wind speed. Uh, here are some statistics for you of the properties of the solar wind, you can still call it, because in the Omni database, these are all merged in to the in situ plasma and field data. Um, you, you know, you would have to go in and manually remove them if you wanted to separate what was happening in solar wind from what was happening in the ICMEs during active phases. Uh, so um, bear in mind that the statistics of ICME properties have been analyzed and are in the literature. 
and they tend to give you higher speeds as you might expect. Um, some higher speeds, they tend to give you higher magnetic fields. Um, they give you the high dynamic pressure pulses that you see. So they contribute the, some of the extremes of the solar wind parameters. Um, this was just re reiterating the fact that if you look at the omni statistics of speed, uh, where most of this is, at least is, you know, at quiet, quieter times is solar wind, um, the ICMEs, a lot of them are at solar wind speed. So the, the large fast events are pretty rare. There's many more ICMEs than, than you hear about. And that's because a lot of them are moving pretty much with the solar wind. And sometimes it's hard to distinguish them from the stream interaction regions. Now that ejecta, the, the reason I drew the flux rope is because people found that if they analyzed the magnetic field geometry behind that piled up solar wind, uh, it could frequently be fit very well by a coiled picture of magnetic field lines, a, a flux rope driver. Um, these these things, the way they drive magnetic storms, um, depends on whether you get a lot of southward magnetic field or not from the ejecta. And uh, what we know is that we see uh, flux ropes that have different um, polarities. Some of them have a leading southward field and some have a leading northward field, depending on the orientation of that flux rope as it comes by you. And uh, so the sequence of the pattern of magnetic storm activity and its proximity to the pressure pulse reaction of the, to the sheath of the magnetosphere um, will depend on whether you have a north first or a south first magnetic cloud. So um, be aware that not all ICMEs are created equal. And in fact, a lot of um, false alarm warnings that are let out of magnetic storms end up being northward magnetic clouds, mainly northward field. Big challenge right now is going on for people to be able to predict BZ in a magnetic cloud. It's a big research challenge. Solar cycle uh, polarity has shown us, solar cycle studies have shown us that the polarity of the magnetic cloud fields and whether they go from north to south or south to north has a nice solar cycle dependence. So that kind of connects back to how the sun is producing these ejecta and these flux ropes. And um, one clue to the CME process is going to be able, being our ability to reproduce this kind of interplanetary flux rope signature. And things are always messier than the cartoons. Um, these are multiple, uh, multi-point CME studies. Sometimes you have the same CME and you fit flux ropes to the magnetic signatures and you get totally different orientations and very closely spaced space raft. So we don't know how we're flying through them. We don't know how, if they're real cylindrical flux ropes, highly distorted, bent, wrapped around each other. So these are all very idealized. And this just says the same thing. There's interplanetary distortions to these flux ropes that are not um, really understood. So spacecraft are, uh, especially stereo data, are being used in great detail to reconstruct space weather events. Uh, we can triangulate on the CMEs and get their uh, direction of incidence and their um, or direction of motion and three dimensions and their velocities. Uh, they've been inserted into ANLIL in a, in a blast wave fashion, no flux ropes. So you can go and you can run what's called a cone model into ANLIL solar wind. Uh, cone model is just a gust of high speed wind that you can send in in a certain direction and with a certain width. So just bear in mind, it doesn't have that flux rope in there. And that's going to affect its uh, propagation. Uh, but this is the best we can do right now on a routine basis, is inject a gust of solar wind in within a certain cone for a certain time in a certain location in a certain direction. And you can do that within the tools provided to you at the Community Coordinated Modeling Center. But you, 
even deducing these cone injection parameters is an art form, and there are a number of papers written and a number of organizations that do that, uh, using the coronagraph information to get the direction. And without stereo uh, and using only SOHO, it's very limiting. Um, and we are learning the value of stereo to that ability daily. Uh, so this is just to say that Goddard, in this ISWA site that you played with already, uh, regularly tracks cone model CMEs that they inject on the basis of the coronagraph information. The NOAA Space Environment Center does predictions for uh, CME, ICME impact based on it. Right now, a development is that we can uh, inject multiple cone model injections. And so there's a lot of times when you don't have a, a CME that's just isolated, but you have a series of them. Because once in, very often you get a nice active region that's really charged up, and it doesn't just make just one. And it matters to have more than one, because you, pay, you might influence the conditions through which the next one is moving in an important way. And for example, here's a period in August 2010 where we had one there, and there was another one, and there was another one. And this is common. This is quite common now, the solar maximum, is you have a series of events that are piling up on one another in pretty rapid succession that you have to track and uh, take into account. Uh, so here's some NLIL results for uh, in the blue line compared to data uh, these are densities at stereo locations and uh, Earth for August 2010 period of multiple CME injections. The CME injection or arrivals are shown with the yellow bars at the various spacecraft. And you can see how well Enlil did in marking the arrival time of those uh, bursts. Okay, so that's just saying that Enlil is making progress. Solar energetic particles. I have five minutes for solar energetic particles. Um, that's our. That's really a frontier. Our next frontier, I think, in prediction and modeling. Uh, they have many practical consequences. The astronaut, uh, human programs care about them. Uh, the spacecraft operators care about them because they cause electronic issues. Um, in chips and things like that, and they um, impact materials in adverse ways. And you saw the snow on the coronagraph images. Uh, two main types of solar energetic particle events that people have named are impulsive events, which are uh, relatively short-lived, have rapid onsets, are often associated with uh, flare at the sun, um, and decay away usually in a matter of hours. Uh, and then there's the larger, more important, gradual events. These are protons. Uh, mostly protons are uh, what people refer to when they talk about solar energetic particles. Even though there's all species, electrons, heavy ions, uh, the protons are the, the norm. Um, and the, these uh, gradual events can last for days. These are multiple events that piled up on one another. Um, and they uh, have a character uh, that tells us they're probably connected to the shock wave of the ICME traveling outward that's acting like a source of energetic particles. So I always think of the impulsive events as, as fixed on the sun sources and these uh, gradual long-lived events as traveling shock sources. Uh, you can look at travel times to 1AU for uh, this is assuming a fixed source on the sun for various energies of particles and get an idea for how many minutes or hours. Uh, these are the first, first space weather that you get from an event that has everything. Uh, for an ICME event uh, with, with SCPs, most, if it has shock, you probably get SCPs. They arrive first, usually. And, pardon? Oh, after the, sorry, sorry, yes, the photons. <laughs> I forgot the photons. Um, and so, um, you know, there's sort of a harbinger of the strength of the shock that is getting to you and uh, its time scale and direction. Uh, a full up space weather event, uh, you can break it down if it's coming head on to you, especially, and you see all parts of it, and you see the flare on the disk and all. 
you can see, you can make a timeline. You, you can lay out all your data. You should have a flare at the right time. You can, then you see the um, SCP electrons and the SCP protons coming. And the lower energy protons might show another increase when the shock arrives at you. Uh, shock arrives at you in a, a couple of days. So you'll get the SEPs in you know, a fraction, uh, th 30 minutes, an hour. Uh, but then you'll wait a couple of days to get the, uh, the actual shock arrival at you, which is the source of these uh, SEPs, these gradual SEPs. And then the cloud goes by in a, a day or two. Uh, so the whole event um, is, is sort of annotated in that way, uh, can last a week, uh, typically, if it's a big event and it comes straight at you. Uh, spatial characteristics depends on where you are. Uh, if you're connected to a flare-related event that sits at the sun and the source is always at the sun and particles travel along magnetic field lines to a first approximation, the energetic particles like test particles, you don't have to think of them as part of the solar wind. Think of them as a separate population of test particles. They don't move radially. They're controlled by the magnetic field, the Parker spiral. Okay? So um, they come along the Parker spiral lines. And uh, if there are, it's a fixed source at the sun, uh, you'll see the impulsive event. If you're connected to the shock over time, you see an evolving gradual event depending on how your shock connection to the shock source how your magnetic connection to the shock source is changing. Uh, you can look at time series here and see how the timing of the SCPs looks with respect to the arrival of the magnetic cloud. And you can see the SCPs coming earlier. And you can see the low energy SCPs uh, having a localized peak when the shock itself arrives in the protons. Uh, and it doesn't always happen, but um, for a head-on event, it's often there. And um, once again, um, remember that where, what you see in an SCP time profile depends on how you're located with respect to a particular ICME. Uh, so your profile will be a characteristic depending on that. And there's a whole literature on what to look for at the various positions. And these are just some examples of distributed SCP data from the stereo and ACE spacecraft. For a while, we had a real-time display that would update every five minutes that would tell you exactly what the SCP situation was at B, at A, and you know, affecting the solar system at large, basically. We were helping Mars mission people diagnose problems on their spacecraft, for example. Uh, acceleration processes for SCPs, a whole field in itself um, involving a lot of theory and numerical simulation of Fermi acceleration, bouncing between magnetic mirrors, stochastic acceleration, shock drift acceleration. There's a lot of uh, names that for the different types of acceleration. So I always like to just think of the shock as a black box out of which SCPs are being shot. And that goes a long way. Uh, bear in mind that uh, shocks, people study shocks for a living. Uh, there are shocks in the corona uh, that, depending on you know, how fast the CME gets going and how fast it's expanding, uh, you can go super magnetosonic in the corona. This is a plot of alphane speed versus radius in the corona, where the alphane speed is dominating the magnetosonic speed. And you can get an idea from your CME speed where you're going super alvanic. And that says your shock is starting within a few solar radii. And so the SEPs are starting to be generated within a few solar radii. Um, and these produce radio bursts. Uh, you may have seen things that look like uh, this in the, in the literature and websites. And those, <coughs> those are a signature of shock acceleration of particles. And there's various, various radio uh, generate, signal generation mechanisms that uh, you can understand from a plasma physics standpoint. And various time series at different frequencies, various frequency signatures with time, depending on the burst type, whether it's connected to the electrons traveling along the field lines or the shock traveling uh, by itself. 
So uh, we went through the key properties of CMEs with solar cycle. SEPs also vary with solar cycle. Uh, so they're very bursty, however. Uh, and so solar activity maxima are these clusters of bursty events. Uh, and, um, and so we also have a situation, as you might expect, uh, where CMEs with their shocks are, are depending on solar cycles, so why not the SEPs that they generate? Makes sense. Uh, there are many source issues with SEPs. Um, we, uh, we are still seeking to describe the sources adequately. People think that you need a seed particle population that's preheated. Some people think there's, if there are flares going on, it makes it easier to accelerate to an SEP energy because there's already hot particles around. Um, so there's various ideas about what's required to get uh, the SEP source up. Now we have another uh, population of higher energy particles in the solar wind that's generated by those co-rotating interaction compression regions. Um, and these are uh, because the co-rotating regions sometimes generate their own shocks. Uh, you know, they're localized pressure and they're expanding outward from that localized pressure ridge. And so they can make weak uh, energetic particle uh, signatures. Uh, it's interesting to look at the broad energy spectrum of ions and electrons that are in the heliosphere to get an idea of here's solar wind down here for ions and electrons, and here's SEPs, and here's CIR particles, co-rotating interaction region particles, and here's galactic cosmic rays up here. Uh, the, I was going to tell you about the modeling I'm doing with NLIL, where we're identifying shocks. Uh, we're characterizing them and the magnetic field line connections to them. Uh, here was a nice event in July 2012 where Enlil did a very good job, as you can see by the blue lines and matching the, uh, the shock arrival time, and so that gives us a confidence in it. Um, we have in our model a certain viewpoint of magnetic field line connection to the shock source that keeps changing in time that we're programmed into a code. and um, we can model, try to model. This is a measured event here on the top from uh, stereo A. And these are our shocks in our model. And these are the SEPs that we have coming off the model shocks. So we have a possibility of modeling the SEPs from an NLIL model now. Uh, now, I have been asked to mention galactic cosmic rays, which are these underlying uh, energetic particles that are in antiphase with the solar energetic particles. Um, the galactic cosmic rays are battling from outside in. And so in the SEPs, we've got an internal source of energetic particles, but the galactic cos cosmic rays have to fight the solar wind and interplanetary field and come in. And that's why you see this modulation that was mentioned by Andreas. Uh, that the galactic cosmic rays are at a maximum when the sun is quiet because it doesn't it isn't fighting a tide of CME debris and uh, you know high magnetic fields and messy magnetic fields uh, so magnetic fluctuations are used very often in a diffusion equation to describe the modulation of galactic cosmic rays and this the what's observed in galactic cosmic ray intensities uh, spectra are uh, very well described by uh, energetic part of population that's trying to diffuse through convected fluctuations convecting out at the solar wind speed. The heliosphere is a big topic because of Voyager uh, reaching the heliopause and termination shock recently. And now there's a debate about the shape of the uh, heliosphere and its interaction with the inter. inter stellar medium and whether there's um, a bow shock or not, uh, and whether it looks like a more subsonic interaction or supersonic interaction. Uh, with the sun at the center here and its outflowing solar wind uh, coming to a stop here at the heliospheric termination shock, and then there's the boundary between what was solar wind stuff and what was interstellar stuff. There's a lot of charge exchange going on in this region, and it kind of mixes things, too. So it's a very messy problem. And um, there, are, there are careers built on that messy problem. Uh, heliospheric pickup ions are another thing that's in the mix. Uh, neutrals can come in 
quite freely from the interstellar medium. Uh, they don't see boundaries, they don't see shocks, they can, they're coming in at a 25 kilometers per second because that's the relative speed of the interstellar medium relative to the sun uh, from what people can infer. Um, what happens is that they get ionized as they approach the sun and then they start gyrating around the magnetic field. So all of a sudden they're affected by the magnetic field. And these pickup ions now are a mass source on the solar wind that was flowing and it can bog it down. Uh, you know, it really changes the, the mass. So the momentum is now carrying, carried into a greater load of, of mass flux. And uh, that is, has been worked into the distant, he, the distant solar wind models that you see uh, that is, are seriously trying to do the heliopause problem. Uh, so we went back here to our uh, ion spectrum and this little edge here is the pickup ions showing themselves. Uh, they have a characteristic energy spectrum because of the nature of the pickup process and they're seen in both uh, helium and in, um, in protons as well as heavier elements. Um, and here's just a little cartoon of the process of the inter interstellar wind of neutrals coming in. Uh, the wind particles getting ionized, picked up, and then carried out with the solar wind. So it's a, a very challenging thing. And then you might have seen these pictures of um, the energetic neutrals coming from the heliopause that are telling us something that we quite don't understand completely. Uh, but the interpretation is that this band of energetic neutrals is associated with the draping pattern of the uh, of the interstellar magnetic field around the heliosphere. So things are really getting busy in the heliospheric area and the IBEX mission is still operating so you'll see more and more from it. Uh, we've totally, totally neglected dust. Dust always gets neglected and it's probably very important. Um, so um, there's a big group in LASP for example that's working on dust experiments. It's everywhere it's probably doing things that we don't quite know or appreciate. And uh, detection schemes are improving all the time and databases are growing. So that's another area of expansion uh, for you to look into. So there's lots to do. There's far side magnetographs, there's time dependent coronal models, there's many aspects of solar wind uh, and heliospheric physics that we don't understand. There's SEP modeling. Um, and so uh, I congratulate you on your choice of subject <laughs> and wish you the best of luck in filling in uh, and going forward uh, because um, it's, it's really a, a perspective building area to be part of and to contribute to. Thanks.